Yes, Father Clay. I was going to ask you a question more about the distinction between prophecy and prophecy. Can we remit sins or only God remits sins? Only God. But I think the thing is, because of the be, being a, a reflection of that priesthood, yeah. we can icon. But I mean, even even the lay people, the Lord's Prayer, the words "Office more, Office more." What can we stop steal, man? The, we, well, he, but but in the Lord's Prayer, we're, we're called the offices. Right, but a lot of the thing you're right we, to forgive or to remit or to put into remission, but that means within us because it's what we hold against them, type of thing. Re and in fact, if we take the word. You know, the, the debt. The, one of the ways you can say that in the Lord's Prayer is release us or put into remission what we owe, meaning God. The way we release or put into remission what people owe us. But can we do the second part? Yeah, because it's within us. It's not, we're not really, they're not being released within them. We can, we can release, but that doesn't mean they're going to appropriate Does that help? Yeah, I think so. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you you're talking in Greek now. Are you referring to the part that says well, it's oh, we forgive when Forgive us as we, we forgive those yeah. who trespass yeah. against yeah. us. It's, it's kind of a technical it's a different dimension of forgiveness because the word synchorisis. Synchorisis means make room for. Make room for synchorisis. Yeah. Synchorisis. And the other word is offices. Even in modern Greek, we say "officine," leave me alone, <laughs> take away, right? Let let go of the hold. Yeah. And so that's really what I want to hear more about. Let go of the hold, right. of the debt, and the place that you know the, 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 it has to do with responsibility of the consequence of sin that we have to let right. go of. Well, the, there is a the letting go is both ways. God will let go, but I think the thing is whether we will let go, and I think it's a good point. There's a mutual, like, sin kodisi implies it's a making room together. Sin, any time the word sin, like synagogue, like synergy, etc., means together. So it, it's a mutual aspect, but it, I, I just want to get it away from the idea that it's simply just some sentimental emotional, which is how people take it. Like, I've, I've really been learning now that when sometimes I say I'm sorry, it's not because I really want to change anything, it's just I don't want them to feel bad about me, so I say I'm sorry. It's not necessarily because of my brain, I'm really planning to make some changes. Right now, I don't like that you feel bad about me. So I'm gonna say I'm sorry. Just to get them off your back or what? Yeah, in a way. Yeah, in a way. Okay. In a way. That I'm I'm and for me now, okay, I'm learning to say, you know, forgive me and the fact of like I'm, I'm repenting. Because and maybe I've been around too many people in my lifetime who were, um, you know, drinking, beating their wives, God knows what, and yes, they were sorry after each time, but then bum. Right. Yeah. So where's the real release? Saying I'm sorry, you know, maybe, maybe it is true, love is never having to say you're sorry because love would mean you're making some changes. I'm not saying, hear this, I'm not saying never say you're sorry, but I, I, it makes you think about that. How many people use I'm sorry as just a way to, yeah, and that would be the synchronicities is an inner disposition, a feeling that the synchronicities, right? But the offices is an action. Right, right. But even synchronicity would have an action because it's like you're making room. The thing that crowded out your life now, <coughs> that actually even doesn't allow room for God, it's like I have so much anger and rage at somebody that hurt me, I have no room for anything else. And that's why we make amends before coming to liturgy. Yes. If possible. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah. It, it is. It's, it is if possible. It's not. There's some people we can't. We can't. That's it. Okay. Um, That's kind of like taking the log out of your brother's eye. Right. That, that classic one, too. Okay. Okay. Um, all that the symbolism of the wedding expresses, we know the, the ring was a big deal to begin with. It was put on the right hand. We don't know which finger, by the way, but they were, the rings were put on the right hand. And probably because they didn't sit there, you didn't go to the jeweler and size them up. So it was our fingers that <laughs> <at all. laughs> You know, and, uh, and so forth. But we know they were generally on the right hand. And it's interesting because the right hand, this is very powerful and actually very challenging in a world that sometimes treated women as property, where she, 
the ring, so in the fact that eternal, perpetual, and so forth, there's no beginning or end, was the idea of sharing of authority, sharing of life. Okay? An incredible, um, you know, it's a lot more than people realize. It's, again, not just some sentimental thing. When the prodigal son has the ring put back on his, his finger, that's an incredible statement. That's an incredible statement. Mm -hmm. Now I get into the parable, uh, which is so many levels to that that people don't realize so often. And, we don't, and even in, when we preach, we can only focus on maybe one aspect at a time. And, and often. But anyway, so there, are, there is symbolism that is expressing all this. Again, spiritual realms are physically expressed. Uh, those of us who know in the Orthodox wedding service <coughs> that all those things, there's no vows really per se. There's just expressions. And the idea behind it is those symbols are the ways because God enfleshes. God works in creation. He energizes creation to manifest his presence and power in a way that words alone can't. Um, many Christians are so dependent on words, or they go to the extreme and just they get dependent on emotions. But uh, I like what one biblical commentator said when Jesus is trying to explain the night before he dies what he's going to do. He, in a very solemn and powerful way, without going into all the, like, intellectual detail about what he's going to do. He takes those things for every one. But again, because there's a reality that is being fleshed out in that bread and wine. And that the Christians who continuously did that, um, I mean, the apostles would not understand somebody, for instance, not having the Eucharist at least weekly. They go, what the heck is that? It's like saying, I only need to have sex once a year. My spouse. Well, unless we're older or sick or traveling or whatever, what's going on type of thing if you're, you're only randomly, and just as a quickie sometimes. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but you know what I'm saying? That this is something that expresses a deeper, more physical reality and so forth, but that words alone don't carry all this. Anyway, because God is the one incarnatedly joining all this together, okay, because, again, no vows means... It's not our word alone that can make this happen. But we are responsible to take on this life and this, this work God has for us. When divorce does happen, it is, I, I use the analogy, and please hear this, we're not, this is not to make anybody feel bad, guilty, or whatever type of thing. I'm just using this now just to understand that, that it's severe. It is taking, if you understand, like I do this in wedding services where I try not to have the bride have her dad bring her up, or he, he, she only comes up halfway, um, which is fine because I have daughters and I've done that kind of. But the <laughs> but I can cheat because I'm the priest. But <laughs> I will bring up both the bride and the groom together. I like that because it's it's not daddy, it's God, it's Jesus. The image of the priest bringing you together is the important part. Okay, and besides, by the way, for what that's worth, not to take away the sentimental feeling. But we know this. The dad bring, it was he was exchanging his property to the new property owner. I love that in this women's lib era where they don't understand. <laughs> anyway, so when I bring a couple down a lot of times, I will hold their hands together in, in my one hand. I'm holding like the gospel in one hand, and I'm holding this there in the other, and I'm, I'm holding like their hands together. And the analogy of divorce is like taking a, a baseball bat to Jesus' hand. It's not just you're splitting for the two of you. You're taking the bat, the hammer, the baseball bat to the hand of Jesus. And that's why it's one of the reasons it's a sin, because it destroys what... Now, and hear this, we understand people get in, involved in situations like, oh my God, it got horrible, abusive. And there are, and this is where I may need to look at my laptop, because I have a bunch of stuff I put on there. Um, situations where some of the fathers of the church even say in very early on and this is true in Judaism yeah you need to get divorced you need to get away from that there's no question that contrary to sometimes I've heard some very stupid things on the part of Christians that you should stay in a sick abusive marriage even to the point that some of them um, would say that if your spouse is committing adultery you need to divorce them. you need to get away get out of there Get out. There's no question. You, you read some of them, even almost like there's no hint to try to see, the, to rectify, reconcile, and so forth. But 
How about remarriage? That's another question. That becomes another question. <coughs> the other thing. Um, <coughs> people automatically assume that um, if one of the spouses is having an affair, if he's in, you know, an adulterer, that that would be a cause, biblically, for divorce. But there's also, and I remember talking to you about this, it's not just taken for the exact word. There's other reasons that the Bible would support divorce, like a, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure you're going to list some of these for me, if it was, for example, if you stopped becoming a believer, or if you stopped your spouse from, um, if you stopped your spouse from worshiping the Lord, could you list some of the reasons for our audience where, biblically speaking, um, yeah. it's okay? I mean, maybe okay. abuse would be one, yeah. adultery. Well, let me let me throw out a couple of thoughts about why you would or should separate. Now, Saint Paul was asked that question, but he said. Um, it's pretty heavy, don't. don't forget the question. Yeah. Um, he says you don't have to separate if if you have an unbelieving spouse, but if they start to the sense is as long as they don't interfere. As long as they don't interfere. Okay, in that way, because you having Christ in your and, and we have this. I mean, from time immemorial, where you ha might have a married couple and only one became a Christian to begin with. Is the marriage, thank you, is the marriage still legit? Is it still in the Lord? Yes, because you're in the Lord. Type of thing. Um, we have, actually even in the Orthodox Church, where we won't marry a Christian to a non-Christian to begin with, because it's, the wedding service is so powerful about being Christ and the kingdom and you being both co-workers in that reality, why would you want to impose that on a non-Christian? That's silly. So, uh, but having said that, then you get people even who marry somewhere else or whatever and they come back, they can, they can be part of the church as long as their spouse is interfering and there's some healthy aspects to it. Now, two things I want to say real quick uh, is Jesus uses one word where he says uh, you should not divorce except for pornia. That's in Matthew's Gospel. But if you read Deuteronomy chapter 24, in the Septuagint, it says you can divorce because of askima pramata. Horrible, bad things, un, uh, impure, I don't know. What, what are the kind of translations for the word askima type of thing? Ugly. Yeah. Ugly, yeah. So th there's, a, there's a general sense about that it isn't just sexual. Yes. It isn't just sexual. Askima pramata, that's pretty general. Shameful. Hmm. Yeah. Could it be mentally and verbally abusive, too? Could that be considered uh, grounds? Not just one time, but a pattern over years, and there's not going for change, yeah, yeah, and there's not yeah. going for counseling. Could that be biblical grounds for divorce? Yeah, I mean, there, there's later, later they develop different reasons uh, for that, uh, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's things that play in. I think the thing that they would say, though, is this. I mean, let me jump back to Jesus. Jesus is pretty strong about, he's not crazy about that idea about remarriage. I mean, it's very clear that remarriage is a real touchy situation. And the only time he's, if you, if you read only Mark and Luke, it's like there's no, no, no openness to remarrying. Yes, get away from the sick, abusive, blah, blah, blah. But if you read Mark and Luke alone, the only thing that gives a little bit of an out, it seems, is in Matthew uh, 19, where it comes out except for pornia. And so the point I think I want to make, because also at the time that there were two, I don't want to get into the heavy history here, among the Pharisees, there were two groups of the Pharisees, and, and the, the school of Shammai, the school of Hillel. And they were both arguing about where can you have divorce. And both of them, though, were playing into it more almost like, I don't know if you want to use the word liberal, loose, approach to that. I mean, there were parts of Judaism that if your wife burned your food, you could divorce her. Come on. Yeah, you could. <laughs> you go outside and you, you get two more to happen to <laughs> you, get, you get a couple people to witness. All you have to, no, seriously, all you have to do is to get a, a, a piece of paper that says, I divorced her three times 
and they yeah. sign it and witness to it, two witnesses, and then you're legally divorced. Wow. Okay. But so we deal with that issue, but I still think that in the early church there's a very strong feeling about this, that if someone remarries after divorce, that it, this is not normative. This is really exceptional. Even St. Basil and other people, like a year without communion, if you remarry and so on and so forth. Now, having said that, okay, having said that, um, and that God hates divorce because of the idea of it, what it does to God. Now, even if one party is more of the guilty one, all right, if you want to use that word uh, type of thing, it's still something that is hurtful. It is still something that breaks the image and icon of Jesus. And so, to go into a second one, because we can't get away from the fact that in Scripture, one marriage per lifetime is really what it's about. I'm going to, the idea that if marriage is about God, if you understand as a Christian that marriage is about God, hear this, I'm not saying people should not be married. I don't know why, I'm not charging. It says plug in, find another power. Oh, that's, that's not power. No, I think I did. No. I got it. Okay. Gregory Nazianzus will talk about um, how many brides does Christ have? He talked one. So the idea of remarriage, if it happens, and it did, we know in the earlier centuries before. Constantine and, and the legalization of Christianity, we know remarriage happened. Even to the point that in many circles in Christianity, even if your spouse died, you were expected not to remarry. That's how strong it was. The idea of one marriage per lifetime was that strong. However, people remarried in both cases, okay? In Rome, they were more like, okay, she, if he or she dies, go ahead and get married. Of course, I wonder if somebody's married seven times that way, they get really worried. Um, <laughs> what's in your wallet? <laughs> 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 but anyway, <laughs> uh, that's that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the the idea that it happens, and when it happens, is there restoration, and and that's what we start to see in the church, because at the time, some of the fathers are very much like, that's it, no way you could ever remarry. It's also the time in the second century, and some of us know this, that with a, have studied the Shepherd of Hermes and all these other things, Christians were struggling of how serious a sin can you commit after you've been baptized and still be a member of the church. Huh. Which they struggled with. Yellow thing. Okay, since we're on the subject of marriage here, it seems that you're speaking about how serious uh, the Christians want to have one marriage be a lifetime and even if there's a divorce or if the spouse dies um, to remarry would be something extraordinary now on the total different spectrum in the small minority of so-called Christians Mormons say where they're allowed to have multiple wives and in the majority in the accepted view of Islam and Muslims they can have as many wives as you want. Can you give us a perspective on this, how it's totally different from what you just told us? How can you have multiple wives? Because one is, is, is a handful, from what I understand. In the Old Testament, do you have multiple wives, too? <laughs> and you might, about you might want to hit Father on the... Viagra uh, coming in my head, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Old Testament, where they had, you know, multiple wives right. as well. All right, real quick. Uh, up, upshot of it is simply this. No, Jesus goes back and points to God's original intent. That's the bottom line. Okay. Judaism was not clear about monogamy until about 10th century after Christ. Really? They still had places where they had more than one wife. Mormons have a whole different theology behind theirs because a woman can only be saved by being married to a Mormon male. So, okay. and that's why wives better be good because, honey, I won't resurrect you at the end. Not for the good old days. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I mean, Jesus, Jesus himself defines marriage. Man and woman, bang. Not man and women, 
man and woman. That's the only definition Jesus has for marriage. How about a marriage at like a JP, Justice of the Peace? Well, that's a legal thing, but that's not that's not Jesus. Or like a, a non-Orthodox church. Well, that's a whole different thing of different theologies about marriage. Okay. Though, they would, I think it'd be fair to say this. There is a level of marriage being uncovered there. We can't deny that. As long as the intent is to live together for a lifetime and enter in some level of that partnership. We would just say that the fullest expression of marriage is what the church talks about. But to say that, oh, they're all living in sin, this kind of thing. But doesn't it like say... Like some crazy Greek yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Father, can you clarify the, uh, the, the scripture that says uh, he who divorces his wife and marries another is is, uh, adultery. Uh, is committing adultery. Right. So what if you, you know, by some crazy chance in your life you've been married a couple of times or, and then, you know, you're married. So does that mean that you're sinning with the, the woman that you marry? It can. I mean, if you, 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 you take the text. You take the text. And, and that's how serious, I mean, you, and, and now keep in mind, I don't want to lighten up Jesus' words here, but the thing is, marriage is very severe. Mm -hmm. And that, keep in mind that men could easily get divorced back then. And so that groups. goes for Old Testament and New Testament. Oh yeah, they would, again, remarriage became, became allowed, it became allowed. But understanding that it was... Um, well, later, and, and I don't like using the word like this, katikonomian, for the household, for the sake of the salvation and, and somebody being in part of the household. <coughs> and that's what I wanted to get to a little bit here because there is an allowance becomes, after the second century, there is an allowance. And even like there is evidence, we don't have all the documentation, but many of the fathers of the church from the fourth and fifth centuries talk about, they've seen and knew of people that remarried in the second and third centuries. So what's going on, is going on, in fact, Tertullian talks about being able to remarry. And he was so strict, he was, re he was crazy. <laughs> I mean, he was so, he was, he was a lawyer. So he really was like, the law, the law, the law. Well, Tertullian allowed for a remarriage, okay? That's at the end of the second century. Both of them became heretics. Well, Hippolytus was a schismatic. He, he was just that he wasn't the Pope. Anyway, so. <laughs> I said that. Anyway, so. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> he was P.O. that he wasn't the Pope. So he's more of a schismatic than a heretic. Tertullian went off on the, the Montanist kick. I'm crazy. But he still was writing that. He's, Tertullian is still a good uh, thing to look at as far as the practices of the church at the time. And he did waver. I mean, and this, I think, is before his heretical period because one of the things later is he's upset that the Bishop of Rome, Callistos, actually had remarried. Hmm. Now, Callistos' wife died, okay? But that's, there was still a strong feeling about it. Even if it was death, you try to stay single. Okay. So Tertullian at least records is a good insight into the practices and approaches of the church at the time. Yeah, the thing. Oh, since we're on the topic of marriages, and you know, here's a perspective that I wanted you to give a direction on, and it deals with the uh, the old and the young. It seems like with the younger generation, they just don't have the respect for marriage. It can be one year, and they've got married and divorced, and married again and pregnant, and is thinking about getting a divorce, and already met another guy on the internet versus in the old mindset, and Greeks are notorious for this, the old mindset is you just stay with your husband because it is what the Greek people do. If they're abused, mentally, physically, cheated on, not taken care of, and they just stay with it, and when you ask someone who, Greek who's married 40 years, why aren't you divorced? I ordered a divorce 30, 40 years ago. You just don't do it. You stay. This is our life. Right. So two perspectives. Young people will divorce like changing a pair of socks. And the old people, they will stay because this is what the Bible wants us to do. Well, I think it's part of the idea of not understanding God and his perspective in all this. Mm -hmm. I think in both extremes, they don't understand. Because, again, you read where you're actually being told so in some of the patristics. They were telling them, divorce, get away from them. And later they use a phrase that I like, is that 
this marriage is no longer redemptive. Wow. We live in the day of 21 day marriages now yeah. among celebrities. But, it, but it's gotten so bad, it's so broken that it's not redeemable anymore. It's not redemptive. And redemptive, though, they, they would say more, though, not just because it's so broken, but they would say because Christ isn't here at all. There's nothing. In the marriage. The marriage right. is no longer redemptive. Right, right, right. That's what they would yeah. do. Would that be safe to say that Christ was never in that marriage to begin with? No. No? No. This is where we get into the thing about annulment. Okay. That's a real, that's a real dangerous thing to play with because we don't know. Uh, you know, that if so, it has to be the, when the church allowed for it. And God bless uh, Pope Francis, he's challenging this issue because they're, they're rubber stamping annulments out there what? in a lot of places. Because annulment means you have to prove they were never, ever really married as far as the church is concerned, ever. And the only, time, the only times I've ever read that annulments ever happened were things like the marriage was never consummated, there was something else going on, uh, like the person was homosexual and never planned to change their lifestyle in the least, uh, but they're extremes, they're extreme things. Right. Or something like that, they were forced or some yeah. uncanonical thing. But if you read the, if you look at the, at least earlier on, I haven't read it in a long time, but the Roman Catholic theology of annulment, it's, it just sounds so legalistic, you know, trying to kind of prove a hula hoop of how some technicality was not in place. It's amazing. They bring in psychologists, lawyers. They, they, they have to, they have to, as Father Meyendorf, God rest him, used to say, they have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to make it prove that somebody married 20 years with six kids was never married to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's well, the is there, is there a theology that God is the one who marries that in that couple together, and there could be cases where God did not actually perform the marriage, did not... Well, that's what, annul those th th that's what an annulment would technically be. Okay. But there would be something fruit-wise that would manifest that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's okay to say, and this is the thing that I, I, I appreciate about how the East has kept this perspective. Okay, so it broke. It broke. God's in the redeeming business. It broke. My ego doesn't want to. I mean, I could want to say a moment because my ego would like that. Well, you know, I don't want to admit I made a mistake. I don't want to admit that I was suckered into this crazy thing or stayed in this sick situation for so long. I want to say God was never there to be gone. Not my fault. Not my responsibility. And and so, just to let you know something I do when I handle some of the divorce situations in the ecclesiastical court when I've been in private, I will even ask the quote unquote sometimes what more innocent partner look fucking situation is, and I will say, ask them, and just out of curiosity, what do you think you contributed to the to the divorce? How did you contribute to the divorce? And that's very telling to me, because that tells me whether they're really married, open, or potentially could be prepared to marry again. Because sadly, most people use the ecclesiastical court as just a way to hurry up and get married again in the church, not because they really want to deal with whatever injuries really happened in the past for healing. But that's a whole other thing. So, I just, just want to add a quick comment to that. That's why with that, that last point is important. That's why I just want to go back earlier when Father Dimitri was, began this whole thing, uh, this whole topic with the vision of marriage. The vision of marriage. So they come to Jesus to test him. It says the man had all these wives, you know, who gets him. And Jesus says, in the, in the, you don't know scripture. In the beginning, he created man and women. So he still brings us back to the vision of marriage. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, have, if back we back. don't have that, we, we lose our entire anthropology. So the vision of marriage, even if it has been broken, mm -hmm. is just as important for the person who's been divorced or the person who's uh, been abused or the person who's single. It's just as important for them to have it as the person who's married, right? Mm -hmm. Well, my people perish, fall into anarchy without vision. Uh, Proverbs 29. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, going into the remarriage thing, that when it happens, is it, it means a repentance, redemption, 
I call it, like you saw in the theology, I call it redemptive brokenness. It can be like the wounded healer. That it actually could become an opportunity and should be very much seen as an opportunity, but now to approach it with in a healthy, grounded, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, every other way, approach to all this 